My name is Shivam. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Kanpur. I teach and do research in hydrology and water resources engineering. So as you know that I'm working in IIT Kanpur and IIT Kanpur is situated in the heart of the Ganga Basin. So sitting here we can see lots of changes. We, can, we are witness to the changes happening in the Ganga Basin, be it in terms of uh, vagaries of rainfall, be it uh, change in uh, temperature and consequently changes in evapotranspiration, be it uh, extreme uh, uh, summer, extreme winter, uh, heat wave. So over the last uh, 12 years uh, since I have been in Kanpur, I have seen uh, uh, weather patterns have uh, noticeably changed. And some of it is reflected in the observations uh, we have been doing here. Then the aspect that we see uh, is uh, change in the groundwater level. Uh, though it's not perceptible, the groundwater is below the earth's surface, so not uh, uh, perceptible easily. But uh, the number of deep tube wells that uh, this campus had and the number of failures that we have seen over the last uh, decade uh, reflects that uh, the groundwater is uh, depleting in this region. As you know, Agriculture uh, is the biggest uh, consumer of fresh water in the Ganga Basin. Uh, estimate shows that uh, it consumes up to 90% of the total fresh water consumption. And hence, if we want to, if there is uh, a water crisis, agriculture would be the sector which will be most uh, affected. Then uh, this region has a lot of industries, many of them depend on water so those two would be uh, affected and then uh, water supports domestic uh, consumption also so all of them would be affected agriculture would be uh, most affected by changes in the water resources availability of the water resources the very first step in uh, addressing these problems uh, using science would be observation once we know or we, once we can quantify the problem then we can find uh, scientific solutions to them. So irrespective of the, of the sector, the very first thing will be to uh, measure how much water is being used, when it is used. Once we have that data, one can find out uh, ways to uh, optimize the uh, usefulness or effectiveness of uh, the water used. The water use efficiency can then be improved. And once we have exhausted the historical storages, so once the water is out, sustaining these kind of academic campuses is in question. So that is something which we can uh, easily relate to sitting in the campus. If you are not paying why you should uh, monitor. Uh, uh, see, the research shows uh, that once you know how much you are using, it itself is a motivation to reduce the uh, consumption. Research shows that once you know, for uh, this is for residential uh, uh, use of water, it has been shown that if one knows how much water is being used, uh, very easily up to 30-40% of water can be uh, conserved. So just by knowing how much water we are using is, is, is a good motivation to uh, conserve water. There may be lack of such research in India and uh, as I said, one of the reasons is that we don't have Usually, we don't have a, a, you know easy way of measuring the things, and that's where I think uh, uh, products like uh, uh, you know, flow meters, etc., could be useful, wherein we could easily monitor how much water is being uh, being used, and uh, then one can show that this, this. these data can be used uh, uh, again depending on the environment. Uh, so, if we talk about urban settings. Uh, if you know uh, uh, discharges of the flow rates in different pipes, you can find out uh, uh, about the blockages and leaks. It was surprising for me when, when I was told that uh, in general in India, about 40% of the water which is supplied in a typical urban setting gets lost because of leakages etc. So these flow meters can help us to find out how much is the loss, where the loss is happening, and thus we can uh, 
uh, fix those uh, uh, problems. In agricultural sector, uh, if we know uh, how much water is being used and we can find out uh, how much of it is actually used by the plants, then we can uh, apply water in such that uh, it is actually used and not uh, wasted. Similarly for uh, industries, uh, if the industries are uh, uh, incentivized depending on how much water they are using or how efficient their uh, uh, per unit production with respect to water is, it will be incentive for them to improve the uh, water consumption. And again, this can happen only when you have the measurement of how much water is being used. You have to do a proper auditing and then find out avenues where uh, water can be uh, water can say they should also sensitize their uh, uh, people involved in these organizations about uh, uh, about the water and its consumption so it should be a, a society driven initiative for groundwater also if you recharge your well it doesn't mean that uh, uh, that the groundwater is confined or it is a localized thing uh, it's uh, uh, the, the recharged groundwater will get distributed over the aquifer and everybody in that aquifer will benefit. But I should also say that the uh, harvesting or groundwater recharge is not the panacea of this. See what happens that if there is a rain and you uh, stop it using check dams or dams and recharge it, you are stopping that water to go somewhere else where its purpose was. So it's not that the floods are not important. You can make these check dams to reduce the floods, but the floods are equally important to get the fertile soil. It is equally important for the biodiversity to survive. Some of uh, the living organism needs flood uh, for the reproduction. So it, it's not uh, it's not just panacea that you harvest water and, and it's it's a solution. So there should be a, a scientific basis for it, and the consequences of any action should be studied in a scientific way before you can say that this is a sustainable way of uh, conserving water. What little we know is that uh, the civilization has started along the uh, near the water bodies. So water was uh, the main driver and then water was again the main reason for the destruction of those civilizations. So conserving water, using it uh, in a fashion which is keeping the footprint to minimum, uh, I think would be what uh, would be required for the for the long term survival of the human race same thing happens with the water also the crisis may come so slowly that we may not realize that it has uh, come and it will hit us and to know whether the crisis is coming you have to do the monitoring there is no other way because those measurements can tell you here say saying that this year's temperature looks higher than the past year or this year we have less water than the past year is not we have to have scientific data to know how the predator is coming, how this water crisis is, uh, is approaching. And then we can uh, save ourselves. There are many ways of measuring water and uh, all of them have uh, certain uh, advantages, disadvantages. So there are some applications where one would be better than, uh, than others. So there are some places where ultrasonic is better. I think what, uh, what is uh, important is uh, if you can give something beyond measurements so uh, beyond uh, just the number if you can uh, if one can interpret those numbers if the device are smart enough to interpret those numbers uh, then that will be useful uh, for industry and that this could be done for both ultrasonic and uh, technically electromagnetic uh, have uh, disadvantages in the sense that uh, uh, the power consumption sector is much uh, much higher. Ultrasonic that way is, is better for remote uh, deployment.